Jimmy, can I start? Is it okay? All right. You guys have a full house? You want us ready to go? All right, I'm just going to say a couple words, and then I'm going to give you the chamber and control of everything, so don't break it, including the city. <laughs> hello, hello. Is this on? Yes. Maddie, can you hear me? I want to make sure. Maddie Bauer, can you hear me? All right. Hi, I'm very good. I'm. <laughs> thank you. Good, good evening. I'm Dan Gelber. I'm the mayor, and I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to just say a couple of things, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to our ULI panel. Um, some of you may think of them as a red team, but our panel who are, are going to take and talk to you about what they're doing. I just wanted to say a couple of quick things before we start. Um, you know, when, when I ran for office, and a lot of people run for office, or when they serve in office, people are constantly asking them, you know, why are you raising my streets? Why are you doing this particular item? Why are you doing this particular function? And a lot of those questions are questions that if you're not an engineer, or you're not an urban planner, or you're not a horticulturist, or you don't have a specific expertise, it's hard to answer with a kind of a definitive statement. So one of the things uh, our commission and our city decided to do was rather than just say, trust us, we wanted to bring in a group of independent people uh, who are really experienced in the areas that our city, in the challenges our city is facing. And that's what ULI is. So uh, the first thing I want to do is thank our city uh, officials. Uh, Jimmy Morales is here. Jimmy is standing. You guys can applaud a little bit. <laughs> and um, a lot of our commissioners are here. I see uh, uh, Commissioner Aliman. I saw Commissioner Gangora. I think I saw, I see Commissioner Samuelin. I saw Commissioner Ariola. Uh, I see Commissioner Steinberg ducking down over there. Uh, and so uh, almost the entire, we, we clearly have a quorum. And I, we see some former mayors here, former Commissioner Tobin, former Mayor Bauer. But we have a lot of people here who are very interested in this. And the purpose of this, of, of really this exercise is if we're going to spend uh, so much money, if we're going to cause so much dislocation, there ought to be, we ought to make sure this thing is, as Commissioner Semlin, Semlin once said, is, is pressure tested. So I really am thankful uh, to the Rockefeller Foundation because I asked them some time ago to, if they would support a project like this because they believe in promoting good government practices on a local level, and they said they would. So. The people before you who are going to be running this, um, the nine members of the, there are nine of you, right, uh, of the ULI, are, I, I urge you to look at their resumes online. They are stars in their field. Uh, they do what we do, but they do it in other places. Uh, they do it in the private sector, in the public sector. They have incredible backgrounds, and they are independent folks who came here on their own time, although a Rockefeller covers the cost of everything in order to really review what we're doing in the city and then issue a report to us about what we're doing. And this part of uh, what you're going to participate in today is actually uh, residents coming in and telling them what's on their mind. And none of the questions are going to be filtered. Uh, you'll see pretty quickly, I imagine. And because uh, the purpose really is to give them a sense of the entire holistic approach that's going on here so they can get a, a, a perspective of it that's unvarnished. So they've been given full access to the city and full access to our residents so that they could do uh, the kind of review that we think we, we should have. And that's really what the exercise is about. So I really want to thank Jimmy uh, for opening up city government, really opening up city government. Uh, Susie Torrente is in charge of our resiliency efforts. Thank you for, for the same thing. And mostly thank you to all of you. We really are grateful. This is a, you're not getting paid to be here, um, although there are worse places to go <laughs> to do a review of resiliency. Uh, it's certainly in this time of the year, but we're, we love our city and we really want to make sure we get this right. So we appreciate you coming in, giving your time and, and, re, and your uh, really substantial experience in directing it to our, our little city. So thank you very much. And the, uh, Joyce, this is now your show. Nope. 
it's not, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, we are super, super pleased to be here. What a glorious day um, to be introduced to your amazing city and especially to the passion with which um, your uh, city government and others that we've interacted with throughout the day really approach uh, trying to make sure that Miami Beach is as lovely today um, you know, and every day for the, the, for the future. Um, my name is Joyce Coffey and I'm the president of Climate Resilience Consulting. We're a firm based in the city of Chicago uh, that focuses on improving lives um, and livelihoods in the face of climate disruption. And uh, I'm really eager for my colleagues on the panel to introduce themselves, but before they do, I thought I might just share with you for about 60 seconds um, what our remit is, why we are here. So the Urban Land Institute, as many of you know, is a nonprofit um, with over 40,000 members that focuses on land use and real estate, and um, supported with um, funds from the 100 Resilient Cities, uh, the Urban Land Institute has convened a panel of advisors, uh, all of us volunteers, to really help address the question of whether or not the stormwater and climate adaptation program here is heading in the right direction. And there are some very specific questions that we have been asked to tease out, and we're hoping that you can help us um, to, to learn from and about. One is, are we are on the right track in our approach to mitigate for flooding caused by both tidal and rain? events. Um, two is how can we best communicate to the city, um, residents, and other stakeholders about these solutions and their costs and their impacts and otherwise engage the community in this work? Um, are we working with the right project boundaries, prioritizations, and sequences? And what other investments in public infrastructure should we take on? So those are sort of the nearer term questions, but we also have two other more exploratory and future questions that we're trying to answer. How can the city ultimately advance climate adaptation in private development is one of them. And number two is how might the city use its upcoming business case analysis, which is an RFQ that's on the street right now, to further advance climate adaptation and stormwater management decision making. So we're super happy to have these very um, specific questions and um, eager for your input to them. But I'd like to just turn it over to colleagues on the right and we'll do a quick round of introductions. Uh, good evening. My name is Mark Osler. I work at Michael Baker International, which is an architecture and engineering firm. I direct the firm's business line focused on coastal science and engineering, helping communities, states, and our nation's federal government deal with issues of chronic flooding, stormwater, sea level rise, and catastrophic flood risk. Good evening. I'm Philip Cash. I'm a principal at HRNA Advisors. HRNA is a real estate and economic development consulting firm. I work in our resilience practice. Closer? All the way right here? All right. Lots of experience, lots of experience from up here, I'm sure. I'm Philip Cash. I'm a principal at HRNA Advisors. HRNA is a real estate and economic development consulting firm. I work in our resilience practice. I work with cities to put together comprehensive resilience adaption strategies and then work with cities to actually implement those strategies, focusing on how to finance it and how to set up the institutional framework to make sure it stays on track over time. Good evening. My name is Juanita Hardy and I am Senior Visiting Fellow for Creative Placemaking for Urban Land Institute. Uh, and I come to this uh, role with the background of both art and business, over 43 years in the business world, including uh, 31 years with IBM. And in, in my role uh, at IBM, I was a business transformation principal. Um, I also come with a, a background of over 35 years in the arts, dating back to the 80s. Um, and among other things, I collect art, so I'm delighted to visit uh, Miami Beach each year uh, in December for Art Basel. And it's great to be here and to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm Jeff A. Bear. I'm the Vice President for Adaptation and Resilience at the Water Institute, uh, which is Applied Research Institute uh, based in New Orleans um, that uh, really is uh, mission is to find solutions uh, for the challenges facing coastal communities. Uh, so we do our work uh, in, in New Orleans uh, and in South Louis East Louisiana, but around the Gulf of Mexico uh, and other places around the world. Um, it's a little uh, nice to be sitting here today, uh, not just because we're in Miami Beach, but uh, one of the other reasons why I'm here is until this past December, 
I was the Deputy Mayor and Chief Administrative Officer of the City of New Orleans, where I was also the Chief Resilience Officer, and I oversaw our green and blue infrastructure program uh, that we have started implementing. So uh, happy to be here. I'm a little, I thought I'd given up going to council chamber, uh, but I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Walter, Walter Meyer, uh, principal at Lola, a New York-based uh, landscape and urban design firm, uh, local office, um, and a professor at Parsons New School, uh, and uh, co-founder of uh, the Coastal Marine Resource Center, a nonprofit. So a third of my work is nonprofit, a third of it is uh, professional practice, and a third of it is applied research through academia. Um, most of our work is with uh, city agencies, interagency management between federal government, uh, state, and city governments, as well as the community. Uh, the advisement session I was in before this session was with the commander of Army Corps, commander of NOAA uh, at the National Water Center on um, exactly these issues, how decisions at the federal level impact uh, insurance premiums for the private properties behind these network green infrastructure projects. Yeah, Christian Nielsen, I'm from uh, Ramble in Copenhagen. So we are an international uh, engineering, landscape and urban planning company. And I've, my role is to head up the, um, our international division for climate change and landscape. We have a really integrated approach, and what we've, I, I come here from, to this panel with the experience from Copenhagen, where we've de developed some quite specific uh, plans taking care of these same issues in, in ground, raising groundwater, sea level rise, and increased precipitation especially. So uh, I hope to have some fruitful discussions uh, with you here during the next couple of days. Thanks. My name is Greg West. I'm the chair of the Southeast Florida and Caribbean District Council of the Urban Land Institute. Uh, we have a thousand members in our district council uh, and many of them uh, right here in, in your community in, in Miami Beach. And in my day job, I'm the uh, president and CEO of ZOM Living, uh, which is a housing developer. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Lowe. Um, I came in from London yesterday, so thank you for the weather. Mm -hmm. um, in London, I work at the global headquarters of, of Aon. Um, Aon is a large uh, risk uh, insurance, reinsurance, and uh, investment consulting practice. Um, I'm the global head of resilient sustainability and climate finance. Um, I work with both uh, private sector and public sector clients around some of the challenges that we're discussing today. Um, I travel quite extensively, so you know I've been doing some interesting work in places as varied as New Zealand, South Africa, San Francisco, New York, and Japan. So um, there's there's quite a lot of interesting work going on around the world, and I'm very very uh, pleased and, and privileged to be here to 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 uh, learn what's happening in Miami Beach. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Wilson. I'm with an organization called 100 Resilient Cities which is part of the Rockefeller Foundation, and we're sponsoring the work here today. Um, it is my privilege to work together with your Chief Resilience Officer and Deputy Resilience Officer, Susie Torriente and Amy Knowles, on a project called Resilient Greater Miami and the Beaches, which is a partnership between the City of Miami Beach, the City of Miami, and Miami-Dade County to create a countywide resilience strategy. Um, and that's on, going on now and something that this will inform. Um, I want to thank you for showing up today and for sharing your concerns about resilience and your thoughts about these issues. Um, this is very important discussion that is taking place in cities around the world. Um, it's not just here in Miami Beach. And I think people are eager to have a global conversation about these kinds of issues, and this is the kind of thing that our organization seeks to promote. So thank you so much for having us here in Miami Beach today. Great, well thank you all so much. Um, very much honored to be here with uh, this esteemed group, but especially to hear your feedback specific to the Stormwater and Climate Adaptation Program. So the run of show here is we have 50 minutes. This is our moment to hear from you. Uh, on Thursday we'll be sharing 
feedback on what we've heard and some recommendations, but we're really going to do the listening today. So I invite people to take the mic and give your impressions, your concerns, um, your, your suggestions, and especially what you think has gone well. Um, and when you come to the mic, please address yourself, uh, your name, and the institution that you represent. And of course, we're going to try to stick to the rule that we've always used in these chambers, which is certainly no more than three minutes for any comment. Thanks. Thank you. I'll break the ice. Terry Beanstalk, Sunset Island 3, a 30-year resident of Miami Beach, former president of the, uh, of the Sunset 3 and 4 Association, which is in the midst of an undergrounding and uh, CIP road uh, uh, resiliency project. Uh, for, uh, I did this for a decade. My background, just so you understand, I know something about it is representing developers for decades. Um, Without getting, others will get into the specifics of the good and the bad of the projects. Uh, what I want to address are two issues that I hope that you folks will consider in, uh, in your uh, analysis. One is undergrounding. Uh, the city d basically does not underground unless a community can, will vote uh, uh, and create a special uh, assessment district, which is virtually impossible to do. We did it. We were the first ones to do it on the beach. Uh, we're maybe the second ones to do it on the beach ever. It took us uh, decades to get it done. It still is not undergrounded. The point of the story is it made no sense to us to do a resiliency road project and not underground the utilities simultaneously. And we always believe the city should pay for it. It should all be part and parcel of the same project. Right now, it's being considered as two different projects happening simultaneously. Second is um, the city has uh, imposed over the last couple of years consistently raising the, the, the height of the base flood elevation for homes. Uh, we have an enormous amount of uh, historic home housing stock on the beach. This is not like a lot of communities. We have a lot of homes that are very, uh, most of the homes on the beach were built as custom homes back in the 30s and 20s and 30s and 40s. Mine's 1937. I did historical restoration uh, uh, recently. And you know we try to do everything resilient, but if a house goes next door to you, that starts literally 13 feet higher than you, which is what the rules are now. Uh, a, ru a rule went in a few years ago that raised the houses eight feet, and then a rule went in two years ago that raised it yet another five feet. It created an enormous amount of problem, uh, uh, to me, unconnected with any science whatsoever, since sea rise has been three or six inches over 25 years. The problems it created in the neighborhood were dramatic. Uh, it, these houses not only tower over the existing housing stock, they almost force the old homes to be torn down because no one wants to live in a house and have it look into your backyard, et cetera. The privacy issues, uh, there are issues with uh, mounds, there are issues with, with them being three-story houses with understories. I don't know what's the right answer and what the wrong answer is, but I, <clears throat> I know that I think these, these, they were put in precipitously without a, a, a enough thought, and they need to be looked at in, in detail. With that, I'll leave it to someone else. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Beanstalk. Any and all comments, welcome. Hi, uh, Luis Bosch, I live on, on Palm Island, and I was just recently made aware that as part of the capital improvement project that uh, as part of the, uh, the capital improvement project that uh, the city has undertaken, the, there is no plan to have a permanent generator in Palm Island. And um, I was just made aware of this yesterday by the capital improvement uh, director, David Martinez. And I obviously got very scared because my house right now is two feet under the level of the street. And the street used to collect all the water. It used to be basically like a big catch basin. The street is now raised. Where is that water going to go if the pumps are not working? So that is my main concern right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Wanda Muzon. I'm a, <clears throat> a resident in Flamingo Park neighborhood, which is uh, the historic um, neighborhood just to the south here. And I just want to um, emphasize uh, a, a part that I, um, a piece that I think should be a part of the formula, and that is the creative placemaking. And I'm so glad that you have some of that on your, on your panel. 
Um, the resiliency plan should, it, it needs to include engineering and bioswells and the like, um, but it's so much more than that. And uh, my husband um, and architect um, says that in a very simple way that in order for us to survive, we must first thrive. And so the creative placemaking is going to play a huge role in keeping us uh, surviving. And so um, all of these projects come at a steep price. And so in order for us to not um, uh, just have to retreat, um, I think that it's very important that this placemaking be a part of it. And I so hope that it um, can also include keeping uh, the character, the local character of the place. Um, so keeping the historic districts in place, uh, finding ways to protect these older buildings is crucial. Thank you, and we're so glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Ed Tobin. Uh, I was an elected official here for uh, eight years. Uh, just to give you some perspective, and I'm not going to bore you with uh, a lot of details, although I, I could give you detail for detail if we ever uh, sat down and, and met, actually. But uh, for the eight years that I was here, uh, we were experiencing a lot of flooding. Uh, this flooding had been identified 30 or 40 years earlier, and what I found was a systemic lack of uh, maintenance, uh, a lot of deferred maintenance, a lot of no engineering, no re-engineering. As a matter of fact, I'll give you some examples. We would do neighborhoods where we would completely redesign, and uh, we'd turn on the pumps, and the water would come shooting out of the catch basins because nobody really bothered to check that the outfalls had collapsed decades earlier. So that was a systemic problem which I found all over the city. Collapsed outfalls, we didn't have an inventory of the outfalls. So the flooding that we experienced in the last five years that it's been sort of promoted and uh, advertised uh, and so on and so forth, it's really flooding problems that we've had for maybe 20, 30, 40 years. Some projects would even run out of budgeting, uh, budgeted money or, or fall short on budgeted money because we weren't able to really keep up with the amount of uh, maintenance that this city requires. Um, and I could give you countless examples. Even sometimes we'd look at a neighborhood and uh, our old public works uh, director, we've got a new team now, but they would say things like, you know, we, we really don't need to do this part of the job. Uh, we've already checked and we don't need to do this part of the job. So I'd say, well, let me see the coupons for the water lines if you're cutting water out of the project. Oh, we can't find the coupons, but try, and we'd go out and do new coupons and we'd find that the water lines were completely to percolated and we needed to replace the water, but because of the pressure to get the job done and the lack of budgeted funds, because we already burned through three or four times what the engineering fees were estimated to be. So we've got a lot of dormant projects all over the Miami-Dade County and uh, they're desperately looking for funds to get those projects uh, to go. Um, I'm not gonna get into the, the science. I know you guys are all global warming, sea level rise, uh, resiliency uh, experts, and I just wanted to make sure that in your analysis, you just recognize that the flooding that we experience in Miami Beach is directly related to the deferred maintenance, lack of maintenance, collapsed outfalls. Sunset Harbor, we spent a lot of money um, to redo. Usually we would spend about 300 to 400, 500 dollars a foot, linear foot maximum on projects. We sort of did that project on the fly, uh, but there were drains that were identified in that neighborhood that uh, we had identified as needing to be replaced at failure maybe a decade earlier. So while we did have a ton of flooding in that neighborhood, we had uh, tide flex valves missing from the end of outfall, so at tide rise we would get a lot of flooding in that neighborhood. We had uh, several pumps that had been designed for the neighborhood, but the pumps uh, weren't, two out of the three pumps I think weren't online and weren't working for many, many years. Uh, so there are other issues, so when you, you know, when you sound the alarm bell, you know, you know, and I, I can go over some historical data. They're about to do my neighborhood, and they've proposed to raise my, uh, if my time is out, I'll, I'll, I'll yield, but my neighborhoods, I'm about to, uh, I think they're designing at a five or a 10 year storm. I'm gonna have water sitting in my living room for, I don't know, 24 hours on a 10 year storm in a, in a bad storm. So uh, I've got problems with, with my design. And uh, I don't know, will we ever get an opportunity to uh, address uh, the committee uh, besides uh, today, like this breakout is, sessions or? This, this is, is the moment for public comments. So oh. we're very glad that we've- No, 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 I was gonna give you guys some facts that you could mold into your decision.
But uh, you're welcome to send some facts to the city, and and we can we would be happy to look yeah, at them. We got the for former sure. city engineer here too. He could tell you some of the horror stories. Okay. No, okay. we we would we absolutely welcome those materials. Okay. My Thank name's uh, Ed Tobin, and uh, everybody around here knows how to get in touch with me if you guys want to talk about what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Peter Luria. I'm a resident for 25 years on Miami Beach. Our uh, our islands have been going through hell for four and a half years for a uh, or three and a half years for a uh, an infrastructure and underground utility project. We did combine them, and maybe the end is in sight a year from now when we'll get the underground. A few things I would con I would suggest is you need to look at the water quality. This is a very important resource, and to, to save the streets and to flood private property and pollute the, uh, the bay doesn't really get us any place. And, and I think you need scientific measurements to see you know, all the waste and fecal matter. We have vortexes, but they're very big screens, so you, if, even if it catches a bottle, and some bottles can go through it, the uh, plastic uh, bags, potato chip bags, get caught up in the impellers on the motors and would get spit out into the uh, water. And there's a, a lot of turbidity. And I've seen, I live on a, at the mouth of a uh, canal, and I've seen a lot, I don't see the bottom anymore. And it's not just because of sea level rise. The other problem is this is a, uh, uh, properties have, have skyrocketed and a lot of homes are, and buildings are getting taken down and new ones are going up. Where before we had 28% FAR, a lot of the new ones can go up to 50% FAR. So we're not, we're getting a lot more asphalt, which is raising the temperatures and a lot less green space. That's another big problem. And the other, one last thing I'll leave you with is the, uh, we know we're gonna lose power. Mm -hmm. And yet you have pumps that rely on power without any uh, backup generators, okay? It's like a fire department, the minute that they have a fire, they disappear. We're gonna lose power during a storm when we really need it. And because we're very low, the gravity systems won't work, especially at, uh, at uh, high tides. You need the pumps to push it out. Um, big problem is, even if we have the money, which I think we would, they'd figure out a way to get the backup generators. People don't want these backup generators in their right away in the yards. So it'd be great with these designers to figure out a way to be able to do it and hide it. So, so we could, because I think people would be happy to have backup generators, they just don't want it on their property, but on the other guy's property. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Is it on? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yes, good. <clears throat> I welcome you with open arms. We have been waiting. Well, let me introduce myself first. My name is Nancy Liebman, a longtime preservation activist in the city. I was a city commissioner long before sea rise became a problem, but I have continued to follow it for our city. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about preservation, but very little has been um, reflected upon. Uh, we have continuous issues with trying to save and designate buildings against a, an atmosphere where development is growing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lose our historic values unless there are real uh, solutions for this. We can't just sit here and say, well, the land is low, we have to get rid of it, we need to develop. 
We've gotten as far as maybe we'll raise buildings and build them a little higher, but there's no solution for preserving the character of the neighborhood. And if, uh, if you haven't seen our city and the preservation ethic that has happened here in the many, many years uh, since our little districts were designated, you must see it. But, and look at it in comparison to the development threats that are happening. Mm -hmm. the, the last thought I've had, and it's recent, there was an article in our local paper, and we had a gentleman here from Harvard last week. And one of the most interesting things that I have taken back with me so far, they talk about living with the water instead of fighting it. And I'd love to hear what you all have to say as far as how we live with water. We silently have spoken amongst ourselves and we know there are places that we can use that solution, but we need to hear from experts such as you. I applaud the fact that you're here and look forward to your solutions by the end of the week. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Fred Shapiro. I live in Miami Beach, um, and I'm here. I'm very glad the city is reviewing what they're doing this closely and hopefully much more thoroughly. Um, I'm here to talk about unintended consequences. I live on a canal front home. My seawall is rough numbers five and three quarter feet high, um, which really is not adequate for today. That is, you know, in a, in a king's tide, we'll have surge over the seawall a couple inches. Uh, with Irma, we had storm surge that went up eight inches over that. I talked to a consultant. I wanted to get my seawall raised about six, seven inches, you know, whatever it would work. He advised that, per ordinance, Miami Beach does not permit that, that I cannot raise my seawall at all unless I'm willing to take it up to eight feet, the current required uh, height for a new seawall, or I can take it up less, a lesser amount if I can prove that my seawall could, could be raised to eight feet. Um, I imagine that when you're passing this legislation, you get a good feeling because now by fiat, you have raised, theoretically, all of the seawalls in Miami Beach to eight feet. Mm -hmm. However, the reality is that whereas I could put a cap on for about ten, fifteen thousand dollars. I would have to build a new seawall. That's a six-figure number, something you know in excess of one hundred and twenty thousand. So rather than raise my seawall at all, I'm putting up with the uh, the tsuras of having my property flooded and having my pool equipment rusted out. I don't think that was the intention of the city when they passed that ordinance, uh, but it is the result, and it's not just me that's too cheap to build a new seawall. Um, so thank you for your time, and I. Hope you're looking into all of this so our homes don't flood more when those streets get raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. My name is Peter Coakley, 2105 Meridian Avenue. Um, my daughter and her husband also bought a house on Meridian Avenue. <laughs> I'm not speaking on behalf of the neighborhood, but I've spoke to many neighbors. Everybody's a f fearful about the elevation of the roads because we never got a, a, an answer that made any sense at previous meetings. I'm sure they'll have answers on Thursday. But I'd just like you to consider, too, there is an element of construction fatigue here with the convention center going on. And um, I just wanted to go on the record as opposed to it. One neighbor did make one point the other day. He said it might be cheaper for the city to buy amphibious vehicles for everyone instead of elevating these roads. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Burkow. I live at 590 Lakeview Drive. And to answer the first question that you posed, I believe, yes, we are on the right track. Uh, my wife and I have lived here and lived in um, this home for over 20 years uh, on Lakeview Drive. And much like many homeowners in this city, our home is our biggest single investment. Uh, I believe that the city needs to protect the residents' interests as well as the city's tax base by raising streets and continuing to harden infrastructure. My neighborhood is scheduled for uh, street raising in 2019 and 2020. And I know, yes, there will be construction fatigue and there are a lot of people who don't want the inconvenience, but I think 
this is an inconvenience that we must accept to save our values and to save our city. If we want the insurers to keep insuring and if we want the lenders to keep lending, I think we need the city to continue to protect us as they have been doing and therefore I think we are on the right track. Uh, is it perfect? No. Can it be tweaked and refined? I'm sure it can and I'd love to hear your suggestions. But I think the city must protect its interests, uh, its tax base, and its homeowners' interests by doing what it is doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, oh. my name is Mohammed Islam. I'm a professional civil engineer. I have a huge experience about the uh, uh, sea wall and other issues. So I'd like to discuss about the sea wall. Um, uh, Visibility study, we got to. Can you put the mic just a little closer to your mouth as you read from your paper so we can hear you? Thank you. Uh, now, here clearly? Yes, I can hear you better. Thank uh, you. Okay. Reconnaissance survey, soil test uh, throughout the sea alignment, depth of the sea wall depend on sea bed and soil condition. Uh, to make a sea wall, we must seal underground water leak. Uh, cement, bentonite mix together and make a slurry wall slurry to seal the water leak. Uh, in order to make a sea wall, we need to build a guide wall and uh, underground uh, slurry wall. Uh, I don't know what the stage we are in now. Uh, uh, this is a long process to big uh, giant projects. Uh, Parallelly, city need to hire an engineering consulting company. Those are specialized for the uh, kind of this kind of job. Also, expertise uh, should involve with this job. I would like to talk with some uh, drainage system in our city. First of all, we need to know about the, uh, the uh, causing for flood, use rain and storm water, and uh, tide water. Rain water and storm water should uh, pass through the drain line to catchment area from there by pumping to the ocean, need to be a replace, uh, replace the drainage line with uniform sloping. From the road crest to road edge, always have a uniform sloping, and also road edge uh, have a, a proper drainage system. Otherwise, water can be a stack in the downstream area that cause the neighborhood flooding. From upstream to downstream area, we need a special drainage system that way water cannot be locked uh, and it should be passes through the drain line. Other, our main concern, we need to have a heavy duty pump to drainage system to discharge the water. Uh, so this is my concern about, thank you very much. Uh, I'm also a member of the sustainability and uh, realization committee. Great, so, thank you. Thank and Mohammed, I missed the name of your institution because I couldn't hear. Could you just say one t more time, what was the, Mohammed, you're with which institution? Uh, actually, I'm a professional civil engineer, okay. but I work in civil, a lot of civil construction work in my life. Especially, I build a, involved with the dam construction, mm -hmm. so I know the how to, you okay. know, Great. make a guide wall and thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rita Starr. I live at Palm View neighborhood. It's two blocks west of here, and it's about a three block more west uh, going west. And then we're along the Dade Boulevard, on the south side of the Dade Boulevard Canal. We have many problems with this neighborhood. My husband and I, I have been there, he's 60 years, I 41 years. Um, we love being there, but many things happen there. When the city built a really nice path walkway on the north side of Dade Boulevard. I don't know what the Corps of Engineers did, but nobody asked us and nobody realized that they caused more flooding because the water doesn't, when, it, when you have high tides, the water doesn't like go off onto Dade Boulevard like it did before. It never flooded it a lot, but it was, you know, enough so that we didn't get flooded. Now, every time there's a, you know, a good um, king tide, the whole, our street is um, Michigan Avenue and there's two more avenues, you know, east and west of us. We get flooded, but our houses and a lot of the other houses there are at very low levels. So 
when we have these high tides, because of that, you know, walkway they built for one thing and the rising tides, our, our houses get close to being flooded. Um, another thing my husband said to me, because he understands construction, he said, um, the sewer line always backs up when there's flooding, when there's high tides, and it causes on the first floor of everybody's house that's low enough and there's a bunch of them, the sewage to come up. It's disgusting. But it happens and we have to call, you know, the city's really nice, the people that work in that department, they come with this gigantic truck and they, you know, rotor rooter it out somehow and it works again, but when the tide goes down, it gets better, but it happens every time. Um, we own seven properties there. Like I said, we've been there for years. Uh, we love the neighborhood, but um, it's become a hardship. For example, there's a family that lives in one of our houses on the, right along the canal. And when it floods like that, these two little girls, usually they go out and play to get to the street to ride their bikes or anything. Well, they can't because it's flooded and it stinks. So the parents don't let them out. I mean, it's become really a hardship. And then we heard that the city plans to build up the street on 17th Street, which is one side, and on Meridian, which is another side, like surrounding our neighborhood, and then you have the canal. So if they build up, we're gonna be in a valley so, I mean, you know, I'm a swimmer, so I could just swim out of there, I guess. <laughs> but it's, it, won't be, it won't be good. I don't see that as a solution. And some people have said we should raise our houses. These are tw from the 1920s, all these buildings. They're going to fall apart. And one of our, you know, friends in the neighborhood already checked, and he said it would cost, it would cost 500000 to raise his house, which is small. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the remedy... And I know you guys don't decide that, is to get rid of historical preservation because these houses, they're going to be non livable or non rentable and non sellable and bring it back to townhouses where you could build new and raise you know, the properties to the level that you guys and everybody thinks makes sense. And then uh, I think things will be a lot better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now comes two former commissioners. I was a commissioner for the last four years, and um, I chaired the Land Use and Development Committee for the city during those four years, and I sat in on all of the sea level rise meetings uh, with the a engineering firm AECOM, which was advising the city. Um, I think we're on the right track, but I think there are certain areas that have major problems. One of them, the lady that just T spoke at Palm View is very difficult because they are all older homes um, mixed with some apartment buildings and it has been declared as a historic district so that that's a, a particular problem. I think raising of historic homes is a definite problem that has not been solved as yet because it's extremely costly and uh, there are a lot of homes that were built in the 20s and the 30s that everybody would like to see remaining but you can't force people to do it because of the money. And I think it's something that needs to be resolved. Um, what we did do through the land use and the city commission was raise the height of homes so that a home can be built at base flood elevation plus a freeboard of anywhere between one and five feet. It does not have to be the full five feet. It's up to the architect and the, the homeowner. Um, but the, the base floor, water can go through. On that base floor, it's not, it's not adding a third story. The height is being measured from the finished floor, and that base floor can be a place where you park the cars, or you have a hammock or a barbecue, or make it a beautiful space of some sort. Um, we've also increased the amount of landscaping, and in fact, I've already planted three trees through a Miami Beach commemorative tree program we do need more trees throughout the city to help with the resiliency. We, did, um, we were able, the commission passed a regulation stating that pervious space, it must be 50% in the front of homes mm -hmm. and side setbacks and front setbacks have been increased with pervious so that water can filter down. However, I grew up here. Um, the home I live in was purchased by my grandparents in 1940. I've lived here permanently since 1971. Over these years, flooding has definitely, the sea levels definitely have, have, have risen, 
and um, the king tides, I don't remember 10 or 15 years ago. It seems to me they, they have been exacerbated over these last few years, probably due to climate change, but we're not going there. Um, I, I don't, I think that we need to continue what we're doing. We need to put generators where we have pump stations, and I think there needs to be an educational campaign so people don't believe, because their streets are being raised, that the water's going into the homes. It's not true. There are valley gutters where the water goes through, through the drainage underground, to the outfalls, which Commissioner Tobin mentioned, now have the backup valve so the water doesn't come back into the streets from the sea. It only goes one way. But there needs to be a better education campaign because a lot of residents throughout the beach think, oh, if they raise my streets, the water's going to end up in my homes. And that has to be dealt with, hopefully, by the ULI. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm Dee Dee Whitehorn, also former commissioner. It's former commissioner day, apparently. Um, and I also want to take back to some of what we learned. I was commissioner here for eight years. And when we finished the general obligation bond program, when we started some of this work, we found out a couple things. And so I'm going to go back to some of my notes. Um, we found that we couldn't build our way out of this alone. Uh, you need to look at things like swales. We started a swale reclamation process several years ago without any success because many people had paved over them and made them driveways. And so um, I really urge you, although it may not be popular to look at that, it certainly may be less painful than some of what else we are looking at. Um, Commissioner Malikoff just discussed um, the pr percentage of impervious service and requiring uh, minimum landscape requirements and green space. Many communities have those requirements, and I think it's important. But it's important that we include it in commercial space as well. And some of them, where they can't fix it, they pay into a fund and then create it in other places. So these are all things that we looked at years ago, and I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of some of our institutional knowledge. I'm lucky I can remember some of this. Um, <laughs> one size fits all does not work for our community. We have different topography east to west. And so we can't ignore that what might be a solution in one part of the city may not be necessary or may not work in another part. In addition, we have natural issues. Seawalls in Sunset Islands are very different than those in Normandy, which are actually much more of embankments than seawalls. They're made of a lot of natural material. So I think proper planning is a key. We have to consider all of the neighborhood nuances, including historic preservation, the diversity of our natural surroundings, even in this little island that we live on. And most important to me, for those that know me, is the total cost of this plan, including the ongoing maintenance costs for everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Andres Acion. I, I own two properties in, in Palm Island, which is one of the neighborhoods that's been discussed here as well. Um, Commissioner Malikoff just finished mentioning that uh, most likely the water is not going to be going into our properties, as some people think. But I'll tell you that the backyard of my parents' house, which is also in Palm Island, it has a beautiful paved stone backyard, it does not have any grass. And it has a ramp that goes out to the North Coconut Lane, which is one of these streets that were raised. That ramp was at about a 45 degree angle down towards the street. Now that ramp is a 10 degree increase slanting upwards towards that street. And, um, and again, we don't have generators um, that, are, that are there as permanent generators. Uh, we're being told that we'll have temporary generators in the event that there's a storm coming in. But obviously that worries a lot of the homeowners in the neighborhood, especially when that particular street you have about probably 70% of the homes are under the street level uh, in North and South Coconut Lane in this particular neighborhood. So there's a lot of homes that are going through this and I think that's the biggest worry that most of the homeowners have in, in the community. In addition to also the cost, some of the people were saying, hey, it's gonna cost $500,000 to raise the houses. But there's also you know, a minimal cost that's not so minimal to a lot of homeowners, which is they have to repave their driveways. They have to increase the, their fences. Uh, the fence in this particular house was a six-foot-tall 
concrete fence. Now it's a three foot tall concrete fence. So basically when people are walking or driving on the street, you could look right into the property where before that fence was a six foot fence. So now we have to go through permitting to, and the cost of increasing that fence, which a lot of the homeowners are doing as well. So um, it's just, I just wanted to reemphasize on that. And if anybody wants to see, I have a video that I just shot today of, of the whole neighborhood and, and how many homes that's affecting which is a lot of them in that in that particular street. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Elizabeth Camargo. I'm the immediate past president of the American Institute of Architects, the Miami chapter. And we have created a few years ago a sea level task force and after Hurricane Irma, we create the Resilient Recovery Task Force to deal more with hurricane caused destruction, not necessarily related to flooding. I also sit at the design review board, so many of the issues presented here we see on a monthly basis every time a new home comes up in a neighborhood, and if it happens to be in a somewhat historic area, we have all the residents here up in arms complaining and trying to stop the project. Um, all the commissioners have brought several good points, which is very much what we need coming ahead, but um, I'd like just to add that we also need, I would like to add two more things. One, I think it's important to have a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, a 20, a 50-year plan, so we know that and everybody understands that whatever um, temporary improvements we're doing now, it's not go going to resolve our problems in the very long run, that the improvements have to be incremental, and that will allow the public sector also to save the money. As the, program, as, as the problems come up to have the funds to uh, implement the new solutions. And I also think there, is, there should be a very, the educational portion is very important because I think a lot of the residents see the city raising the streets and what's happened to private property. There should be an understanding that the public sector is also thinking about the private, and there is a plan that can be shared with the private sector, not only in the design aspect, but maybe in the financial aspects as well, to help the residents keep up with the changes that the city is bringing forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Needleman. I'm the um, chair of the Flamingo Park Neighborhood Association and also sit on the city's historic preservation board. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance yet or you will be touring um, 11th Street. It's um, one of the first streets in, in, in our neighborhood to be raised. Um, there were, I guess in my opinion, some issues with that. I think what, what happened there is um, the harmonization efforts between the, the raised road and the adjacent properties was sort of an afterthought on the city's part. Um, if you walk down the street, some, some properties have retaining walls in front of, the, in front of them. Some of them have, uh, the, the ground is just sloped down. Um, so it's, it's, there's no, there was no consistency there. Um, that leads to, you have different issues. Um, you have other practical issues as well. Um, there are now um, some properties that need to I guess carry or bring up their, their trash bins up a few steps to bring them out on the street so they, they can be picked up. Um, regardless, one of the most important things moving forward, whatever your recommendations might be or whatever the city eventually does, I think it's important for you and to, to understand at least our historic neighborhood and what's important to the residents there because we can raise roads and we can do all this work, but if you I'm going to use the word destroy the neighborhood by doing these things, destroy the historic character of the neighborhood, um, you're really not making progress. So I think it's important to, uh, to um, just keep that in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. My name, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Judith Frankel. I'm a fairly longtime resident of Miami Beach. And I have been involved with the Upper North Bay Road Homeowner Association since 1992. We have tried to bury the lines. We do know that that is not going to work because of the regulations in play. But more importantly, everything has to be looked in context. Our Homeowners Association has had in the last 
I would say five years or more, many meetings with the city attorney, city engineer's department, and we never got the same project twice. We never got the same plans twice. We heard everything from catch basins and swale lines to having to be told, rebuild your house. That was not a good statement to a neighborhood that, and I'm not bragging, but we have one of the highest tax brackets of all of the city of Miami Beach for a residential neighborhood. And there's some of us who aren't inclined to rebuild our house. We have seen we're in the commercial zone where street raising has caused properties to make claims for flooding and not have the flooding claims because all of a sudden you are a basement. That got resolved, but can you imagine a business owner having to wait two years and fight in order to get a claim through their flood insurance? It is ridiculous to be told you're going to have streets that are going to be raised, but we're going to have, we're going to have culverts. In Miami Beach, culverts get grown over with uh, grass. Who's going to be responsible for fixing those culverts, we've asked? and yet those culverts still seem to be in projects. Who's going to pay for it? Who is going to take the temporary generators down the block and hook them up as the hurricane is coming and the city of Miami Beach is under a forced evacuation? We have to evacuate. Okay, what city employee is gonna bring that, tr that generator down the road, hook it up, and turn it on? We have had too many projects shown to us, and we've had too many plans shown to us, and all of them don't reflect what we are. We are a limestone-based community, which is over, probably overbuilt. And how many years ago we were told that Durham was requiring us to plant more trees because we didn't have the right canopy. And that's because our city was allowing development to include palm trees, and we learned palm trees don't count in foliage and your canopy. So we have had and what we need, as it's been said, we need a plan. We need a lot of plans, and one of the plans that we need is a plan that the city's administrators look carefully at all, in context and in community. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Franklin. So eight minute warning, we're getting close to the end here. A few more comments? Uh, hey, good evening everybody. Thanks for being here. What a fun topic. A wonderful place. We all love Miami Beach. Um, Jason Biondi, I'm a resident. Uh, three, concern, three comments really about the sea level rise strategy that we said seems to be getting implemented at this point. Uh, first one, like the pumps kind of seem like a silver bullet approach. And is there a better place to, to pump fresh water and salt water than back out to sea? Is there a storage activity? Uh, also, asphalt. Why do we have asphalt anywhere? We're still putting asphalt, surface parking. We're still putting, whatever we do with the roads, raise them or don't raise them, just can we do it out of concrete or something other than asphalt? Same with surface parking. I'm not sure why we're in love with asphalt. And then the last one is plant pallets. Uh, we talked a little bit about water quality. We didn't really get into the ecosystem services of it all, but dune vegetation, less turf grass. I, I mean, it's maybe a wonderful thing. I uh, hope you guys will put that into the melting pot and cook it. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Maddie Bauer, and I was former mayor of Miami Beach. Uh, and you've heard everybody, and I think everybody has so many good points, um, but I don't think that you need to answer the question first, are we going in the right track? I think that I want you all to be very open-minded and not have to answer that question because that will take you to one point. And, I, and the point is, it's very hard for you to say no. So we need for you to think open-minded and gather it 
all this information and take into account also what Ms. Frankel said, we live in a place that when it rains and in flood, if it's low tide, it goes away immediately, which tells me we live in a very porous place, and which tells me that all these places and all these sea walls and all these things that we talk about, it's not gonna be a solution. It's not gonna be the same solution as where you come from because you're higher, you have rocks. Here we have something that the water if it raises high enough, it's going to come through the ground. It's not going to be anything new here. It's going to come through the ground. And so you, I don't know how you're going to do this in 48 or 60 hours to come up with a plan. I think that the rushing is what makes everybody do something that we have consequences afterwards that cannot be eliminated. So I would ask you that if you need more time, you tell us that you need more time. Don't marry yourself to something that it might not be the correct thing because it is true that they're going to come and ask us for money, and we don't want to pay over and over again. It is true what Ms. Frankel said, that we have changed our minds because things change it. So please, don't rush. Look at this with open mind. Look at our soil. Look at our overdevelopment. The more and more that we develop, the more and less that we have of the green space and the permeated ground. So please, don't rush and do for us the correct thing. Give us the right answer. Don't worry about if we're going the right place, if we are now in the right or wrong place. Give us the right answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Alex Mosio. Uh, I live in uh, Hibiscus Island. I've been uh, a resident of Miami Beach for 20 years, and I'm very proud about my neighbors, what they've said. I think they've all raised points and issues that uh, I was actually looking to, to say. But uh, along the lines of uh, overdevelopment, perhaps some of the homes that are being developed and the sites, uh, the, the grounds are being compacted by the construction through that process of construction. So, you know, the level of compaction maybe doesn't allow the water to percolate. Um, perhaps we should consider green roofs. Some of these uh, three-story structures, which I'm actually getting one behind me, <laughs> um, are dwarfing my, you know, the homes uh, around but they're also casting shadows and uh, making vegetation more difficult to grow within the spaces. And um, the sun is one of our features and uh, we're getting all these high rises which are casting shadows on the rest of the beach, um, which is a pity. And then um, I guess, you know, a lot of everything else has been said. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have time for one more comment. Moving statements. <laughs> Good evening, Matisse Cohen. I'm a property owner, builder, developer, preserver in Miami Beach. And I'm here to say that um, I support the efforts that this city has taken. I believe that when the pumps work, our island is dry. It is not a beginning and a middle solution for everything. And as trailblazers in this arena, um, we pay a little price for that, but we don't have a choice. I'd like to speak on behalf of the renters in the city that live in garden apartments. In 1950s and 60s buildings that are eight foot ceilings on the ground, concrete slab, rebarb, sitting in salt water for the last 50, 60 years. Professionals have come and said, hey, we'll charge you $168 a foot to lift it, but we can assure you that it'll work. When we talk about permeable space, and more green space in our city, there's a trade-off. It's either vertical, you can't push the envelope down, and also say to have more green space. It's not linear, it's not a zero-sum game. There has to be some pushback. There has to be another side. And there has to be a reasonable equation for that. We can't raise the roads, create pumps, tax the commercial properties that pay 90% of the city's budget, 
and they say, no, you can't adapt. So that adaptation has to be citywide, not only for a certain property like a private homeowner, but for the commercial properties equally. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for being here. Great. Well, thank you all so much. I think all of those comments deserve a huge round of applause. We're really, really honored that you spent the evening with us um, sharing your passion for this place and your specific recommendations for how we can help you to make it better. And uh, we're going to take all of this under advisement. And you know, to the point about rushing, yes, we hope to see many of you here again in just two days' time. Thursday, uh, 3 to 4.30, we'll be reporting out on our initial findings and having an additional question and answer. Um, and they, we then take uh, many months, frankly, to come back with the official report to the city of Miami Beach. So um, I want to thank especially the Urban Land Institute for the incredible work that you've put into helping us get to this place and for the work you will be putting in <laughs> for that three months' time to make sure we really do our homework well and provide uh, the city with excellent recommendations. And um, thank you all very much. Have a lovely evening. Um, I know it will be lovely out there. And I look forward to seeing many of you again in a couple of days. Peace.